Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the Lord's Supper and kind of doing a series of lessons on that. And I think today will be the last one so that people don't get fed up with it. But uh, the, yeah, I can tell you know, a couple of people got the joke anyway. But um, no, but in this lesson this morning, I want to really kind of reflect on something that maybe we don't think about because the Lord's Supper is done so often that we kind of we lose sight of this particular fact, but it's really weird and offensive when you think about it. Because we're basically talking about eating the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. And to the outside observer, that's got to sound pretty strange. you got to imagine how that sounded in the first century. You know, when there were rumors going around about how the Christians were cannibals because they were eating and drinking the body and blood of somebody named Jesus. Well... Why is that? Why is it that the Lord commanded us to observe His death in this way? Why is it that we might be described as cannibal Christians? We're eating Jesus' body and blood? He asked us to do what? Well, what I would like to do in this lesson is maybe just talk a little bit about cannibalism in the Bible, because it's a subject in the Bible, uh, and, you know, kind of look at some Old Testament passages particularly that talk about uh, what it was and why it, it's repulsive. And then really kind of then turn our attention to Jesus and what he had to say about it. And maybe may make some observations from the New Testament passage on the subject. In the Old Testament, uh, when we talk about cannibalism, we really kind of have to start with the Law of Moses. The Law of Moses contains two sections in it that we might call curses of the covenant. God made a covenant with His people, and then He has the blessings of the covenant, which are the good things that will happen to you if you keep the law of the Lord, and the bad things that will happen to you if you break the law of the Lord. And inevitably, the list of bad things is way longer than the list of good things. Uh, But there are two passages that work along these lines, and both of them mention cannibalism. Uh, One of them is in Leviticus chapter 26, The other one is in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In Leviticus 26, and I really, I just kind of want to read this um, in context to explain what's going on here. In verse 14, the Lord says that if you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes and if your, your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly for your enemies will eat it up. I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies and those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee when no one is pursuing. That doesn't sound very good. Hmm, we should probably do what God says. But if God does all those things and then they don't repent, uh, well then there, there's this constant refrain that's repeated throughout Leviticus 26. In verse 18, If also after those, these things you do not obey me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. He starts talking about inflicting them with famine and drought and ruining their crops. In verse 21, it's the same thing. If you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, which will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your numbers so that the roads lie deserted. Mm. Verses 23 and 24, the same refrain is repeated. If by these things... You are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me. I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will punish you, will strike you seven times for your sins. He talks about bringing the sword and warfare in. And then it gets even worse. In 27, from 27 onward, he starts talking about exile. But he introduces it this way. In spite of this, you do not obey me, but act with hostility against me. Then I will act with wrathful hostility against you. And I, even I, will punish you seven times more for your sins. Furthermore, you will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you will eat. I will then destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and heap your remains on the remains of your idols, for my soul shall abhor you. God will hate people for breaking His covenant. That's pretty harsh. 
because, you know, he's inflicting them with famine, turning the earth to bronze and the sky to iron. He's inflicting them with wild beasts that kill their children and desert the roads. He inflicts them with warfare so that seven women are forced to break bread out, to bake bread out of a single oven and ration out the food. But when the food runs out, people resort to eating their own children. These people eat each other. And it's explicitly said to be a punishment for sin. The worst of the punishments yet in a string of of plagues inflicted on the people to get them to repent. That's pretty grotesque. Deuteronomy 28 does a similar thing in showing how cannibalism is just really the, the worst of the worst in us. In Deuteronomy 28, beginning in verse 52... The Lord says uh, that, well, He's talking about this nation that will come and attack them and besiege them and how that nation, in verse 52, will besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down through your land. It shall besiege you in all your towns throughout your land which the Lord your God has given you. But verse 53, in the context of that siege, it says that then you shall eat the offspring of your own body the flesh of your sons and of your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you, during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you, the man who is refined and very delicate among you shall be hostile toward his brother and toward the wife he cherishes and toward the rest of his children who remain, so that he will not give even one of them even any of the flesh of his children which he will eat, since he has nothing else left during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you in all your towns." Verse 56, the refined and delicate woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground for delicateness and refinement shall be hostile toward the husband she cherishes and toward her son and her daughter and toward the afterbirth which issues from between her legs and toward her children whom she bears for she will eat them secretly for lack of anything else during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you in your towns. Again, that's pretty grotesque. That's in the Bible. And people think, oh, I would never do something so grotesque. I would never do something so egregious. But God claims that even the refined and delicate person, even the proper person who thinks it's inappropriate to talk about this subject at the dinner table, will engage in this kind of process as a punishment for their sins. They will become so deluded and so desperate and so lost of their senses. They will eat their own children out of hunger. But worse, worse even still than that, not only do they eat their own children, but they're so unprincipled so as not even to share the meat with their own family. It is that terrifying. Now this isn't just something that you see in the Old Testament. There were lots of uh, of other ancient documents at the time that mentioned cannibalism as a curse, uh, various Assyrian treaties and such, which I won't get into here. But, But did this sort of thing really happen in Israel's history? Oh yeah, it did. It's ridiculously unprincipled. Look at 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and verses 24 through 29, it came about after this that Ben-Hadad king of Aram gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for eighty shekels of silver, and a fourth of a cab of doves dung for five shekels of silver. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king! He said, If the lord does not help you, from where shall I help you? From the threshing floor? From the wine press? The king said to her, What's the matter with you? She answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. Ridiculously unprincipled. The siege is obviously brutal. They have to pay 80 shekels of silver for a donkey's head, which donkeys were unclean. You couldn't eat them. But there they are. They're selling donkey's heads for 80 shekels of silver. They're selling dove's dung for five shekels of silver. And you're going, wait, people are paying to eat that? 
And they were, because that was the brutality of the siege of the Arameans on Israel. And these are ridiculous prices to pay for utterly worthless food. The law of supply and demand has forced prices of any kind of food to astronomical heights. And then this woman confronts the king. And the king, of course, he's powerless to help, which is part of the point of the story, that the king is powerless to save. But it is God who ultimately delivers this city. He has no access to a threshing floor. He has no access to a wine press. They're pretty much doomed. The only person who can save them at this point is Yahweh. And then the woman describes her situation. She actually made a deal with another woman so that they could eat each other's sons. And they've already eaten her son. And now the other mother is trying to back out of the deal. There's some similarity to this incident in 1 Kings 3 where these two mothers come and they each claim the child is theirs and Solomon says, well, we'll divide the child in two and give half to each of you. At which point the real mother pipes up and says, no, don't do that to my baby. And the other mother is like willing to go through with it. And so Solomon can tell how to solve the scenario because, you know, a mother's love knows no bounds, right? Except in this story, the mother's already killed her child and eaten him. So clearly we've thrown out maternal love as a principle by which society must operate. And what is the most shocking and perverse thing about this story, perhaps, is not the fact that she's just committed this abominable act of eating her child, but the fact that she seems completely oblivious to how horrible it is. She wants instead, you know, to eat the other woman's child too. Her complaint, not that she had to eat her child, but that the other mother is suddenly getting cold feet on their sick little deal. She should be forced to share. And let me tell you something. In a society where mothers are willing to resort to cannibalism, how can you trust anybody, right? It's terrifying. There's, of course, more, more on this, we could say. It's a terrifying judgment described in the prophets. In Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah describes the people of uh, Israel and Judah, of Israel eating each other. He says, Wickedness burns like fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It even sets the thickets of the forest aflame, and they roll upward in a column of smoke. By the fury of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No man spares his brother. They slice off what is on the right hand, but still are hungry. They eat what is on the left hand, but they are not satisfied. There we have self-cannibalism. Each one of them eats the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh devours Ephraim, and Ephraim Manasseh. And together they are against Judah. In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. God says, you know, since... The wickedness is consuming like fire. He's going to make the people consume each other. In Jeremiah chapter 19, Jeremiah Jeremiah liked to perform dramatic sighing acts in the temple, or rather the Lord liked to tell Jeremiah to go perform dramatic sighing acts in the temple. In this instance, he's got to take a clay pot and smash it in front of everybody. But it's what he says beforehand that is so brutal The Lord said, go and buy a potter's earthenware jar, take some of the elders of the people and some of the senior priests. Then go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is by the entrance of the potsherd gate. Proclaim there the words which I tell you. Say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I am about to bring a calamity upon this place at which the ears of everyone that hears it will tingle. Because they have forsaken me and have made this an alien place and have burned sacrifices in it to other gods that neither they nor their forefathers nor the kings of Judah had ever known. Because they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent and have built high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal. A thing which I never commanded or spoke of, nor did it enter my mind. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place will no longer be called Topheth or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but rather the Valley of Slaughter. I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hand of those who seek their life. And I will give over their carcasses as food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. I will also make this city a desolation and an object of hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and hiss because of all its disasters. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters, and the the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. They will eat one another's flesh in the siege and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life will distress them. 
on and on he goes. And, you know, before you say, well, God's just being cruel and brutal, you know, you look at the long list of sins he talks about to get to this point. These people are already sacrificing their children in the fire. They have already demonstrated themselves to be completely unprincipled. The Lord says, I'm just going to take it one... Since this is the way you seem to want to live, we'll take it one step further. Make this truly a valley of slaughter. The book of Lamentations, seldom read, describes the situation as well. Lamentations 2, verses 20 through 22... See, O Lord, and look, with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat their offspring, the little ones who were born healthy? Should priest and prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? On the ground in the streets lie young and old. My virgins and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger. You have slaughtered, not sparing. You called as in the day of appointed feasts, my terrors on every side. There was no one who escaped or survived in the day of the Lord's anger. Those whom I bore and reared, my enemy annihilated them. Again in chapter 4, verses 9-11. through 11, Better are those slain with the sword than those slain with hunger. For they pine away being stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. The hand of the compassionate woman, women boiled their own children. They became food for them because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord has accomplished His wrath. He has poured out His fierce anger. He has kindled a fire in Zion which has consumed its foundations. Better to die by the sword than die this way. That's the brutality of the judgment of God. And I'll leave Ezekiel 5 for now in the interest of time. Cannibalism is also used as an image for sin itself and the behavior of the people. Uh, Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter 3. He says, Here now, heads of Jacob, rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice, you who hate good and love evil? who tear off the skin from them and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones and chop them up as for the pot and as meat in a kettle. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but He will not answer them. Instead, He will hide His face from them at that time because they have preached evil deeds. And this text, cannibalism, is not a judgment from God, but rather the behavior of the wicked. And it may not be that they were literally doing this. They may have simply been mistreating people. The Lord says, well, you might as well chop them up and put them into a stew the way you're behaving. Ezekiel chapter 34 describes the wicked shepherds of the people and who were supposed to care for the flock of Israel instead choosing to eat those sheep, slaughter them. In the 14th Psalm, the psalm famous for the phrase that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In verse 4 it says, Do all the workers of wickedness not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is His refuge. Alright, now, now I, I, at this point I think I've, I haven't managed to go to almost every possible shocking, grotesque, offensive text in the Bible on this subject, but we may, we've gotten quite a few of them. Is cannibalism a good thing? Do you think people could have, would have viewed it as something that was just kind of, oh, Jesus talks about eating his body and his blood, right? This is the kind of thing they would have heard. When Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body. When Jesus says, take, this is my blood of the covenant, drink it, all of you. This is the kind of thing. that This is the kind of idea that gets into people's heads. So how could Jesus say something like that? I want to look at a passage that doesn't get brought up enough in Lord's Supper discussions because a lot of people think it has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. But wait for it, it does. In John chapter 6, the Gospel of John chapter 6. The Gospel of John in chapter 6 records the feeding of the 5,000 people. And that miracle is actually in all of the Gospels. But John takes it in a different direction. Alright, so in the first 14 verses, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Uh, and then, of course, because the people decide, hey, he feed 5,000 people, he'd be a great king. Jesus decided to run away from the people. Uh, you know, he sent the disciples across the water, he withdraws by himself, he eventually walks across the water. You know, you know that, that's pretty impressive when you walk across the water to get away from people who are trying to make you king. Um, Alright, so that happens. 
But then, in verse 22, the crowd corners Jesus anyway. The next day, verse 22, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with His disciples into the boat, but that His disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias, near to the place where they ate the bread, after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor His disciples, they themselves got into the small boats, and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found Him on the other side of the sea, they said to Him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And you might think this is a good thing. I mean, these people really, really want to see Jesus. I mean, after all, shouldn't everybody want to see Jesus? But Jesus rebukes them. And you you and I both know why they're trying to find Jesus. Because Jesus, they're looking for a free handout. They're looking for a free meal. Jesus is going to feed them. The only problem with that is that by the end of this conversation, Jesus doesn't feed them a thing. Uh, it's interesting. He feeds 5,000 people. Everybody always wants to point to that story and say, see, Jesus feeds all the hungry people. Nobody points to the story where Jesus refused to feed the hungry people because you're not here, you're not here for the right reason. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on Him the Father, God has set His seal. And from here we have the famous discourse that Jesus gives on the bread of life. There is, of course, the food that you all ate, that you put in your tummies and digested. But then there's another food, a greater food. A food that if you eat of it, you'll never hunger. You'll never die. You'll live forever. And, I mean, it's it, you can imagine the, the excitement over this sort of thing. I mean, talk about, you know, the food I gave you was perishable, but this is imperishable. Well, the Jews, of course... They ask Him, well, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus responds, well, this is the work of God that you believe in Him, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. So belief is a work. Uh, uh, And they said to Him, well, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? You know, because apparently, well, the miracle that we just witnessed somehow doesn't count. You know, you just fed 5,000 people. And then they say, well, Jesus, we want to see a sign. Prove that you are who you say you are. I just fed 5,000 of you from five loaves of bread and two fish. What more do you want? Well, of course, what's going on here, uh, they claim that you know Jesus' miracle wasn't really that special because verse 31, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Okay, all right, manna. And... I mean, you know, manna is probably the most perishable food that ever existed. It bred worms within 24 hours. Right? But the bread of life, Jesus is going to talk about, the food He will give them is imperishable. So, I mean, they try to argue, you know, you're no better than Moses. They quote Psalm 78, 24 here, which is ironic because, A, Psalm 78 talks quite a bit about how Israel is rebellious against God in spite of God's dealings, so it doesn't, it's not a text that makes the Israelites look good. And second, because Moses didn't give them the bread at all. The he in that text isn't Moses, it's God, which they would know if they were, you know, if they would stop quoting scripture out of context. Thank goodness we don't have that problem today. No. Anyway, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses, who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the bread, the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Well, of course, you know what the people do? The same thing, this is a common thread throughout the Gospel of John, is every time Jesus says something, people completely misinterpret what he says. Uh, it's, you know, they're always guilty of taking him way too literally. Because the next thing the people say is, Lord, always give us this bread. Um, which they're missing the point a little bit. And, you know, to be fair, if you read John, you see the same thing in John chapter 4, for instance, where the Samaritan woman at the well, uh, Jesus tells her, I have water that no, if you drink of it, never thirst again. And first thing she goes is, I want to know where that water is so I don't have to come to the well anymore. Well, they're the same thing. You know, we we want some of this bread you're talking about, Jesus, so that we don't ever have to go to market again. We don't ever have to pay for our food again. We like this idea. Well... 
Then, of course, you know, this is the most disappointing thing is whenever people tell you, oh, I have this food. You eat of it and you'll never hunger again. Oh, really? Where is it? It's spiritual food. What? No. It's like if you go on a game show and you win a car and then they say, well, you want a spiritual car. Well, you're going to feel a little shortchanged there. Um, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life who has come to the world. Well, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you, you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. So here Jesus uses it to get back to His point that He's been making several times already in the Gospel, which is this talk about a spiritual resurrection. There's, of course, the bodily resurrection that will happen in the future when all rise from the graves, some to a resurrection of life and others to resurrection of judgment. But then there's the spiritual resurrection, the one in which the hour is coming and now is. The one in which we are now being raised from the dead by hearing the words of life. And, oh dear, well, Jesus, you're going on about that again. But, I mean, you know, there's a point to the metaphor. Because you think about it, you think of bread. Bread is the thing that gives you life, is it not? I mean, if a person goes long enough without eating and drinking, they will die. Food isn't a passing fad. It's not going away anytime soon. Hydration isn't something that's optional for the human race. Those are things that are absolutely mandatory if you want to live. It's like breathing. And if you don't get constant nourishment on physical food and drink, you're going to get sick and die. But here's the catch. Does bread really give you life? No, it doesn't. Because if you eat bread every day for the rest of your life, you're still going to die. It's a rest of your life that has an eventual termination point. And I mean, we eat and drink today. We're going to be hungry tomorrow. We're going to be hungry. We'll probably be hungry and thirsty later in the day for that matter. That's why people typically eat more than a meal, than one meal a day. Even though food and drink were designed to sustain life, they're not fulfilling that purpose to the utmost extent. There's something missing. They're inadequate to fulfill the purpose in the ultimate sense because, well, the curse of sin still hangs over our heads. Death is still hanging over our heads. The death sentence is coming for each and every one of us. And eating all the bread in the world won't stop it. But Jesus says, I've got real bread, and if you eat that, you live forever. Something that does away with the the root cause of death. Something that does away with the problem of sin. Something that actually brings about resurrection from the dead. And that's the words of life that Jesus speaks. Jesus Himself claims to be this bread of life. A bread that gives us a spiritual resurrection now and a physical resurrection later. As the prophet Isaiah writes, in Isaiah 55, in verses 1 and 2, He says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is performing these miracles related to abundance. Abundant water turned to wine. Abundant bread given to the people. An abundant catch of fish later in chapter 21. Jesus promises the true abundance of life in the resurrection of the dead. But you know something? There's a problem with Jesus saying He's the bread of life. Is that, wait a second, I mean He didn't say His words were the bread of life. He said He Himself was the bread of life. And that, well, people get mad about that because... It sounds a little offensive in light of all that cannibalism stuff. Maybe you misspoke, Jesus. Maybe you intended to say something else, right? So the people start pressing him on this point. Uh, The Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And they were saying, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Because if it wasn't offensive before, he decides to point to it a little bit more emphatically. The bread is actually his flesh. Jesus connects this idea of the bread to teaching here. You'll notice he quotes uh, from Isaiah 54, 13. They shall all be taught of God. That's the prophetic passage he's referencing in verse 45 there. Uh, Now, if you go back and read Isaiah 54, it's about this holy city built on foundations of gemstones, a place where God's people can gather together. But the great thing about this city isn't the fact that it's made of gemstones or has beautiful walls, foundations. The thing that makes this city really special is who teaches there. The people, no, the education system there, Yahweh himself is the teacher. And the way that they will be taught is by eating Jesus' flesh. Well, the Jews like that point even less. They find that offensive. That's offensive, they say. Verse 52 The Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus says even more offensive stuff. He says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, And I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. If you've never heard this before, and you've never seen this passage or whatnot, somebody gets up in church and starts preaching and says, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood, you kind of be a little weirded out. Jesus was preaching this in their equivalent of church, you know, their synagogue. And naturally, of course, this doesn't sit well. And, you know, they they got offended at the implicit cannibalism. So Jesus, you know, he didn't backtrack and say, well, you know, what I meant was this and this and this and this. He doesn't bother to explain the metaphor. Instead, he gets even more explicit, more grotesque, more offensive. You know, this is the sort of thing that would just drive people nuts. You know, here we go, Jesus, you've got a following of 5,000 people and you managed to reduce it all to 12 in a single day because you said something offensive. You know, would you hire that man to be your preacher? Well, that's Jesus. Think about that. Jesus, I mean, six times he mentions eating flesh, uses a word, doesn't use the normal word for eating, he uses a word that refers to like gnawing, you know, really, really biting down and chewing on it. He mentions drinking blood four times, which if you'll remember uh, from the law of Moses, drinking blood was forbidden. This whole speech is designed to shock people. Did Jesus do things for shock value? He did that. And in light of everything we said about cannibalism before, their offense is understandable. Now one thing that comes up, and... The point transition didn't happen when I wanted it to, but is the question of whether or not this is can be applied. These statements can be applied to the Lord's Supper. After all, you'll see, well, eat my flesh and drink my blood. That sounds kind of Lord's Supper-y, doesn't it? And then, of course, you realize, well, that's a different context and that's a different thing. And so, you know, I remember there was a point where I was saying, you know, you can't use that passage, the Lord's Supper, because you know that's not what Jesus is talking about there. He's talking about teaching. And then you you got to think about it a little more because the distinction is not as sharp as you think it is. Uh, <laughs> the reality is this. If there's one thing that the Gospel of John is trying to get across, because he said it at the first point, the first thing he says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
We're going to eat that flesh. And if we're going to use this to talk simply about the Word of God, we can't escape that, no, Jesus Himself is the Word that we are partaking of and eating of. And all that stuff we said about cannibalism is in the Old Testament. But there's some passages in the Old Testament that also talk about eating the Word of God. For instance, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15 and verse 19, that your words were found and I ate them. Your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. Ezekiel, when Ezekiel has a vision in Ezekiel 2 and 3, they present the scroll to him and Ezekiel is told to eat the scroll. And it was sweet in his mouth. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119 and verse 103, says that how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And on and on we could go. Our, one of our songs in our book reflected from Psalm 19. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the, word, and the honeycomb. The Word of God is something that is, well, supposed to taste good. Now, are you li- does that mean we literally come into this assembly and pick up our Bibles and start chewing on the pages? No, that's not what that means. And that's not what the psalmist meant by it. What we're talking about here is this digesting, this incorporation. Um, We're talking about this metaphorical internalization. It's not enough to simply read the Scriptures. We must digest them. We must put them inside of us. We must break them down so that they become a part of us. Such is what it means to eat the Word of God. And if that's true of the Scriptures, how much more is it true of the Word of God, Jesus Christ Himself, the true revelation of God, of whom the Scriptures are an extension? You search the Scriptures because you believe that in them you will have eternal life, but it is these that testify of Me, Jesus says in John chapter 5. And now, if we want to have the Word of God in us, we must have Christ in us. We must digest Him. We must incorporate Him into ourselves. We must internalize His decisive revelation. We must absorb the thing that He did, the thing that He came to do in His death, burial, and resurrection, which is what we're doing when we eat the Lord's Supper. So, is there really that big of a distinction between putting, between putting the Word of God in us and taking the Word of God in us we eat the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, no. That blood is a new covenant. And that body is the Word made flesh. The Lord's Supper is as much connected with this passage in John 6 as baptism is connected with the statement in John 3 that if one is born of water and the Spirit, unless he is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And you know what? You find cannibalism offensive. You find this teaching of Jesus difficult. And they did. There's something even more difficult. And that's the thing we really have to digest and incorporate. In verse 60, many of His disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that His disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where He was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray Him. And He was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to Me unless it has been granted Him from the Father. What will you do? If you think that this is offensive, if you think the idea of eating Me is offensive, what will you do when you see Me ascend? He says, When's that going to happen? Perhaps another way you could phrase it, what will you do when you crucify me? You think it's offensive to cannibalize the Messiah? Why are you about to crucify the Messiah? And if there's one thing that the Jews would have found more offensive than cannibalism, it was the idea of a crucified Christ. A stumbling block to them. But Jesus knows exactly what's coming. He knows the end result. He knows who the betrayer is, even at this point. And so when he tells them they're going to eat his flesh and drink his blood, he's, hint- he's pointing to his death. He's pointing to his true mission on the cross. Self-sacrifice. He's talking about gutting the very essence of everything that they were hoping for in the Messiah. But in- instead of afflicting us with the Old Testament curse of cannibalism, he 
He takes the curse on himself as sacrificial victim, as cannibalized Christ. And in so doing, he demands that we partake, that we eat of him, that we remember what he did, because without him inside us, we cannot live. And there is the great paradox. On the one hand, cannibalism is something grotesque and offensive, something that is the judgment of God come upon the world. The judgment that Christ took on himself. And on the other hand, well, it's something we're called to participate in. On the one hand, the crucifixion of Christ is the shocking, horrifying, offensive event. should never have happened. And yet, it is the event that gives us life. And it is the event that we too are called to participate in. By taking up our cross, following Him. By being crucified with Christ. And no longer living for ourselves, but for the Christ who lives in us. Take out your songbooks. Of course, if we do not internalize Christ, if we do not emulate what He has done for us, well, something terrible tends to happen. Brethren will still be cannibals. And Paul warns against this in Galatians chapter 5. That you were called to freedom, brethren. I'm reading in verses 13-15 through 15 of Galatians 5. You were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. When brethren bite and devour one another, they forget that they were supposed to be eating the body and blood of Christ. Not just in the sense of the ritual of taking the bread and the the fruit of the vine each time we eat the Lord's Supper. Instead, we're talking about incorporating that, making that part of our reality, making that the uh, the defining bit of who we are. If we have internalized Christ, we will eat of Christ and live out His principle of love for one's neighbor. And if we have not internalized Christ, then we're going to wind up biting and devouring one another and consuming one another. Don't be cannibals to each other. You're here this morning, and Christ is not in you, and you are not in Christ. The love of Christ is not in you. Your relationship with God is not what it needs to be. You have not been immersed into Christ. Now is an appropriate time to let that be known, to make your life right with the Lord. While together we stand and we sing the song that has been selected.